Project. Yeah, project. <laughs> so uh, I decided what we're going to do for Lab 4, which I think I emailed everybody, and that is that <clears throat> it, it appears to be completely possible to, to get ECG off of ARM recording. And so this is as, as safe in principle as doing EMG. Put the electrodes, there's, there's two or three different geometries that people talk about. One is to put three electrodes along the arm and uh, with two or three centimeters between them and then record differentially between those. Another way is to put an electrode here and a reference electrode down here. Either way will be acceptable. I don't want to see anything above the axia, axils, axil, axil, uh, ax, yeah. armpit. <laughs> anything above the armpit. Axillary, along the axillary. So, so down here is fine. There's a fair amount of electric field. Yeah, the heart is a dipole, of course. So if we, if we take this sort of generic outline of a human here, heart is a dipole that's something like that big, right? It's about the size of your fist and it's sitting right here. So that might be a little too big, but not so much. Let's, let's scale it down a little bit, more like right here. And you figure that there's a dipole field that looks like this. A few of the field lines are going to loop over like this. You can guess that if with a dipole, if you had a perfect volume conductor, then the dipole field would drop off as radius to what power? So it's squared or cubed? It's quite cubed, right? It's cubed because a point source a point source gives you one over r squared. Two point sources are going to cancel the first order. And so the the only term that's left is r cubed. So so you're going to get an r cubed field over here, but you're still only two or three radii away from the heart. So you'd guess that the size of the field is going to be pretty good sized. And it should be completely possible to record from there, but the, the signal is going to be smaller, and therefore your signal to noise ratio is going to be worse. And so you may need to aggressively filter. You may need to bandpass filter analog and then do a very good 60 hertz notch filter digitally. Most of what the interference you get is going to be 60 hertz. You can use a standard differential amplifier. The INA 121 should work fine. And uh, but the signal height may only be a few hundred microvolts. You may have to jack up the gain more than you, than you use for the EMG. And you may have to, as I said, aggressively filter. I linked up a bunch of the entire lab consists of links to, to about six scientific papers. I want you to read them. Not all of them have to do with this kind of recording where you're having contact electrodes. <clears throat> Some of the papers have to do with dry electrodes, dry electrodes, stainless steel dry electrodes. And some of them, in some of them, the electrodes are capacitative. So there is no contact, no metallic contact with the skin. By the way, one group has done an infant breathing and, cardi and heart monitor in which all the sensors are in the blanket. 
the insulin lays on top of the blanket and the coupling is capacitative through the through the blanket. So the pair of change in body shape. Coupling to the capacitors. You look at the data. I linked it up. So <clears throat> the th dry metal electrodes, which are mostly capacitive coupling, remember that that's a, a metal to skin a contact is really a capacitive contact, and as well as pure capacitive contacts, are going to be rather high impedance electrodes. By high here, we might mean. Mm, 10 to the 8 ohms. So, why is there a push towards non contact electrodes? Why is there a push towards non contact electrodes? I think that there's several reasons why people want to go to non contact electrodes. First, it's easy to put them on. So, you pull on the shirt and you've got the electrodes. Or you lay down in the bed and the electrodes are in the blanket. You don't have to wire the person up. You don't have to put 12 leads on their chest or anything like that. Um, secondly, it, it may be um, safer since there's, with capacitive leads, there's very small chance of actual current flow. And um, it's faster. If you can just slap stuff on very quickly, then you can do quick emergency recording without having to prep the skin and clean it and and glue on electrodes. There could, it is also less invasive. You know, my dad had to get some you know, ECG and then he put all the electrodes on him and it made it, it just like made his heart rate go up and they couldn't take the data they needed to because the whole process of prepping it like made him nervous. And well that's right and it, it is, a, it is, it is a, a stressful thing to have leads hooked to you. I had a cardiac stress test once because uh, a long time ago I was 50, 52, because I reported to my doctor that I had some referred pain in my left elbow. Quite often, when you ha you're having a, a, a lack of oxygen to your heart, the pain appears to be coming from your left arm. And I told her that, that, the, that the pain in my left arm correlated very well with intestinal gas and that I was getting referred pain from my intestine, not from my heart. And she said, it doesn't matter, you're going for a cardiac stress test. So they, 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 they lay on the table, they stick 12 electrodes on your chest, and then they have you get up and run on a treadmill. Yeah, that's what my head and that's, it's really, I mean, you got this big cable coming off you, there's wires flying every place, and, there's, and, you're, and, and you're working, I mean, they work you as hard as you can, right? So what they do is they, they put you on the level and then they start tipping up the, 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 the treadmill until you're <sighs> climbing the hill. And they will make you breathe hard. If, you, if you, they get to maximum slope and you're not breathing hard, they turn up the speed. <laughs> and, um, and, they, and they take you to the point where you're breathing quite hard and almost not you know compensating and then lay you back down and watch you come back your heart rate come back down so i can understand that this it's uh it's complicated and and if you're already worried about heart condition just the pro the process of wiring up can be stressful i wasn't particularly worried because i because me and dr google had already diagnosed it but um you gotta believe in yourself but uh but uh, uh, it was re reassuring, to, so I wasn't particularly worried about the process, but it was reassuring to see that I didn't have any heart problems. So anyway, capacitive sensors require a different kind of amplifier because they need to have an extremely high impedance connection. The I would say that you can probably just about use the EMG that you already built. Change the high pass and low pass cutoffs and use the high pass and low pass cutoffs and jack the gain up probably. 
So don't take it apart when you're done after this lab. For the, for the capacitative contacts, interesting. You remember I drew, I drew this circuit for you oh, quite a while ago, and I said it was used for microelectrodes. And I used it as an example of an amusing feedback system because it had positive feedback back for canceling out for canceling out input capacitance to try and get the speed up. I said, you'll never use this in human recording. Well, I'm full of it, as usual. Uh, so what's done is some variant of, to remove the microelectrode, you put a capacitive electrode near the skin. And what several people have done is to put the electrode directly onto a circuit board in other words, it's a printed circuit, and you slap the printed circuit board against the skin. Or you, put, you flip it over, you put the electrode on the other side, and you put a small layer of plastic uh, imid or, or saran wrap between, your, between the electrode and your skin. <clears throat> to keep the noise down, to keep the pickup down, now this is an extremely high impedance electrode. To keep the noise down, what you have to do is you have to put a shield as close as possible to that electrode as you possibly can and drive it. And you drive it from some place like this, from the unity gain point, like we talked about before for a driven shield. So this electrophysiology amplifier has been modified and used for, for human recording. And people do, are now talking about hooking up dozens of these on a person's head or dozens, there's this, what is it called, my, that's called myo, so go myo, something like that, my myo. My myo, something like, it's very close to that. It's a it's another Kickstarter project that is a band, an elastic band with wireless uh, hardware in it. You slide up over this muscle, these muscles. There's eight channels of EMG, and it allows you to decode your finger motions in real time. So you can do gesture recognition by looking at the muscle output. Again, capacitively coupled as far as I can tell. So. You could build these sensors. I'm, I'm going to suggest that you not try this for Lab 4 unless, unless you want to try something completely different. This looks like it could be a final project. If you're going to do that, you've got to change amplifiers. You have to go to an INA116 or equivalent. An INA121, which is what we're using for Lab 3, has a bias current of a couple of nanoamps, picoamps, a few picoamps. The 116 has a bias current of a three femtoamps. So it is a something like three orders of magnitude higher input resistance than, than the 1 to 1. Also, it has the usual positive and negative input. It looks like the usual diff amp. It has a resistor to set the gain. But it also has two more outputs. It has G plus and G minus. Those are guard outputs. Those are driven shield outputs for the positive and the negative lead. So you don't have to mess, guess where to hook this stuff up. You have the, the driven shields available to you right on the chip. Oh yes, and the inputs are protected against over voltage. 
If you were going to do that by hand, you would have to do something like this. You might have a capacitive coupling input with some path to ground, fairly high resistance, but not ridiculously. These are actually this is not for this is not for capacitive coupling. This is for high resistive coupling. But what you need to do is to have back to back diodes to ground on both sides of the input. So that if the excursion and voltage here is above some value that you don't pop the input transistors of the op amp. Because with high impedance coupling, you could imagine walking up to somebody who has just walked across the floor and is, has, a, has a potential on of 5,000 volts because the air is dry in Ithaca. You put the sensor on their skin and there's a spark that jumps to the input of your op amp and you throw it away because it's now dead. The INA 166, 116 has input protection against that kind of assault, against uh, ESD assault. Is it it's about $10. That's moderately expensive, I'd say. $10 in onesies. But the 121, which is sort of the baseline, is about $6 in onesies. So maybe I should go to these next year for more flexibility. I'm, I'll probably do that. There is, I'm written, I tossed search terms back and forth this morning for a while, and there are a whole bunch of piles of papers on non-contact sensing that you can get to from various um, with various sets of keywords. So far, I think that non-contact, capacitative, and ECG are about the best way to find this stuff. I linked up a bunch of search terms also on the Lab 4 webpage. Don't feel like you have to limit yourself to the six or so papers I linked. L read whatever you want to read that's going to make this lab more doable. I want to make this pretty open-ended and I want to and I want it to be something where you have to go out and dig around a little bit to find the design. Should I should I order some 116 op amps so that people could do capacitive stuff understanding that it might not work at all? Should I okay, I'll I'll get some. I'll I'll, I'll buy some up. There are lots of different geometries. There are lots of different schemes for making electrode sets. Uh, one I've seen is, and I think probably everybody's seen, you grab onto the two stainless steel plates on your exercise machine and you run and it gets your heart rate while you're moving. So there's all kinds of motion artifact and, and, and crazy you know, sweat contact against the stainless steel and just a horrible mess. And, um, and yet it, it gives you a reliable heart rate. There, is, uh, there are designs for that. The, the keywords are gelless two electrode. And I'm going to ask you not to use grip type electrodes unless you can prove to me pretty substantially that there's no shock hazard. If you had this kind of geometry where these capacitors are small enough and there is a series resistor here and here, if you can prove to me that the leakage current through here is below some threshold, say 30 microamps, for any reasonable fault, I'll let you do a two-electrode hand grip kind of thing. 
but you have to be able to justify that in gory detail before you hook it to yourself. Pardon me? These are just grip, grip electrodes. You, 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 hold on to, uh, you hold on to two stainless steel grips and you get, uh, you get a, a reasonable looking EEG. Mostly I think you're going to want to put it on one arm where there isn't any chance of current flow through your body. Again, there are so many levels of redundant safety in this lab that I'm not, I, I, I don't worry too much, but, I, but we have to be completely safe here. And besides, you have to learn it, learn the safety. Um, the next step then, the people are we're interested in is, well, if you can slap these all over your body, they should be wireless. Right? Why, why do we need wires going to them? Why shouldn't they be little autonomous sensors. These sensors are, oh, I think I even have a picture of one of them here. Is the temperature up in here today? Did somebody turn up the heat? Why don't you, why don't you turn the thermostat down to zero over there? Zero. Well, not absolute zero. Thank you. What was it set to? That's a little warm for my taste. Sorry, say again? There's no ground on the legs. None. There's not going to be any ground on your stuff except on the arm. No right leg ground, no right arm ground, no nothing. All connections are going to be to the left arm. I like the effect, the overlay. So <clears throat> this, is, this, is, this is yet another geometry for the input where you have the sensing electrode and then the shield, the driven shield. This op amp, which I don't recognize, but it's probably a high impedance op amp, is AC coupled through the 10 nanofarad capacitor. And I don't know where the bias current comes from from that. I don't know how that works but it's set to unity gain, which means that we have a driven shield here at unity gain, then some AC coupling over to a follower, and this whole unit lives out on the sensor. So that's the sensor, that's a standard snap. That would be like a standard uh, um, snap on a shirt or on an electrode. So this whole thing is on the order of that big around. So, wouldn't it be cool to be able to, to build one of these, and that's the front end there, build one of these that has a, uh, powered by a three volt coin cell and has a transmitter on it. Doesn't have to be a very high power transmitter because you only have to go a meter or so to get off the body. So, um, could be some interesting projects here. This one is wireless non-contact cardiac and neural monitoring. And I think... Where's the wireless part come from? Well, they, they took the, the PIC uh, 24 microcontroller down here and took it to a wireless card. But... Uh, To my way of thinking, each one of these sensors should be wireless. By the way, this particular system <clears throat> has another electrode which actively drives the skin. 
at a value. This is a follower. That's a high gain amplifier. So this is driving the skin in the appropriate direction to cancel out the common mode voltage because it's a negative, negative gain here. So this is a negative feedback loop. And the idea is that you want to get rid of DC artifacts by driving the skin appropriately. These are three electrodes placed there. Well, they're saying that you could have N electrodes for, say, a 12 electrode cardiogram. So you have them all over your chest or some on the legs, depending on what you're measuring. You might slap them all over your head, but, you, but, but you'd, someplace nearby, you would, you would get rid of the average voltage. DRL, probably, probably in this case it's right leg, yeah. It is inverting the signal. There's, there are various kinds of, of noise that you get. Dri driven capacity of ground certainly help the noise. And this contamination is almost certainly 60 hertz or 50 hertz, depending on where this work was done. So, yeah, and here you see people wearing these on their clothing, outside their clothing, which is kind of cool. I, it brings up all kinds of questions. How in the world does this work if you're walking along and your clothing is sliding back and forth over your body? How, how can that? But apparently it does. ECG vest. So, Um, through sleepwear. So, in this case, body, skin, capacitive coupling, sleepwear plus diaper, assuming it's a baby, fabric electrode. Ah, fabric electrode, it turns out you can make, you can now, ha there are, there are certain fabrics which are quite conductive, carbon fiber fabrics, for instance that are quite conductive and you could use as an electrode. You get them a spark fun. You get them a spark fun. You, there's another place that has all kinds of weird materials. Um, yes? How, how do they maintain the baseline? Yeah. But in case of stress test, the person is running So you, 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 they put the electrodes on you, they take a baseline on you laying down, then they get, make you stand up and run, and then at the end you, you lay down until your heart rate comes back to normal. And the cardiologist is standing the entire, entire time making witty comments about your running style. So, um, it's quite interesting. I, I, I think it's, uh, it seems to be a fairly new field and uh, uh, driven by the self-monitoring craze. People want, you know, measure everything about themselves constantly. So, but for now, I'll be happy if you get an ECG off of your arm by contact electrodes and then do some analysis, do some comparisons to uh, 12 lead electrodes to other people's work. Yes? Are the wires connecting the op amp to the sensor also shielded? Ideally, this one needs to be shielded as much as possible. Now. In the, in the puck designs that you saw, the, the op amp was directly on top of the puck. 
and so the connection lead was very very short if you were to if you were to have us a, a longer lead say a centimeter off to I don't think this is going to work to have the electrodes here and the amplifier on the prototype board I think the capacitive sensors were going to have to be completely integrated on the arm Sockets add noise. Sockets, worse than that, they add ground leak. So, so, These guard wires that are coming off of here can go back to a shield, but on the physical integrated circuit, the guard pin, the guard leads are on each side of the input. And so on the physical integrated circuit board, you draw a circle of conducting material around the connection of the lead to the board so that the leakage through the board doesn't matter. And you clean the board with acetone and don't touch it again. This is serious business. This is hard to do because, because um, <clears throat> Your fingerprints have a characteristic resistance of something like 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 10th ohms. And that now becomes the major leakage path across the surface of the printed circuit board. You touch the board, it's shorted for good. You have to, you have to scrub it in acetone and then keep your hands off of it or handle it only with rubber gloves. It was a fairly difficult thing to do. So by putting a guard, by putting a trace around, a G plus trace around the plus electrode, it means that on average, no current can flow across the board into that wire. And oh, by the way, it has to, if, you, if this is a through hole part, the, the trace has to be on both sides of the board. This is obsessive. This is, in most circuits, most circuits, you don't care about the geometry, you only care about the topology of the circuit, the connection pattern, you don't care about the shape. The only time that you care about shape is high impedance or high frequency. You start working with RF, the shape of the circuit becomes the circuit. For high impedance circuits, the shape of the circuit can grossly change the input resistance and the, and the performance. So these wires have to be short, very short, and they have to be, and if, it's, and if it's more than a fraction of a centimeter long, it has to be shielded, guarded, it has to be guarded all the way up to where the impedance drops. That says you don't dangle this capacitor back two feet away on a board someplace, it has to be right at the input. <clears throat> well, if, if it's an INA116, it'll be a 14 pin P dip. That's true. The, guard, the, 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 the pin out is designed for guarding, and that helps quite a lot. But this is, this is a difficult thing to do, and I'm not suggesting that you do it for Lab 4. I'm not suggesting you do capacitive for Lab 4. This might be a good final project where you have a few weeks, you can afford to build a circuit board, you have the time to build a circuit board, or at least wire one up on a hard board, uh, on a hard circuit board of your own, but probably not something you want to do lightly for Lab 4. Now, I could be surprised. It could be just 
that, 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 it, that it works kind of with very little effort. To make it work beautifully, it takes a lot of effort, but to kind of get it working is, is fairly easy. I don't know. I've never done this. My intuition is it's going to be fairly annoying. So read up, read the papers. If you find a paper that you like better than the, one, the six I linked, email me. I'll link it up. Making this up as we go along, folks. Which is kind of exciting. It's, I'm, 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 I'm way more enthused about this than about tissue impedance or or the other possibilities we talked about. I think this is much more fun. And uh, so I think there's some nice instrumentation to come out of it. Then I'll order some 116s, INA 116s, so we can play around with those a little bit. I used to build my own electrometer amplifiers in which I had to um, space shield the, the area around the electrode and I had a little, a little sliding metal thing that I could slide down over the electrode, over the glass electrode to guard it. And it's not fun. So read lab four, come back with questions, because I'm sure there'll be more. It's not very well defined. I'm going to want you to, to produce the usual scrolling display of the ECG, and underneath it I want a scrolling display of the heart rate, the instantaneous heart rate, however you decide to get that. And so, uh, in case of discography, uh, you display a heart rate, and you can even get a heart rate using ECG, um, ECG electrode. So, which in both, if you compare both, which will carry the maximum information, and which is like better as compared for diagnosis? I'm not sure I'm qualified to say which is better for diagnosis. The, uh, they carry different information. The, 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 I mean, it's certainly related, but, but the ECG carries a very large amount of information about the, the status of the heart. Um, whereas the, the pressure pulses carry a, much more information about the, the state of your arteries. And the dynamics of your arteries. Um, so, um, I would say that unless you do, unless you do time of pulse arrival time in plethysmography, you're not going to get any feel for absolute blood pressure or anything else useful except for heart rate. Uh, and um, but but clearly it's useful for as as one of the inputs for uh, oximeter, which is a very useful measure. Yeah. So the other the, another possible final project then would be to to implement a a, 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 a plethysmograph pulse travel time, in which you have a two channel. Did I already talk about this, or did I totally forget last time? Did I talk about this? You can, there's a, there is a, there are two or three studies that have looked at the correlation between the time of arrival of the pressure pulse at your finger and your toe, for instance, and your mean blood pressure. And it turns out there's a co good correlation. And so you can measure the, the, the plethysmograph signal at two different places on your body that have a dis different distance from your heart from each other. And 
measure the distance between them uh, with some sort of measuring device and get an estimate of the, um, of the absolute blood pressure. Again, sounds like an interesting final project. Getting that right, getting it calibrated, getting it useful, because <clears throat> it seems it, it, yeah, putting putting one sensor on your finger and the other on your toe it doesn't seem that practical because uh, how what is the distance exactly? Is it this distance minus this distance plus this distance? But maybe a sensor here and a sensor here would be would be doable. It's one little op-amp circuit that I wanted to show you. It came up also in the context of these, of these uh, um, battery-powered sensors. And that is, it's quite often nice to have a balanced power supply, plus minus V, so that, it's, so that ground is in the center of the dynamic range of the op-amp. And, of course, if you have a single battery, which you often want for cost, you have plus V and zero, and that's all. So it would be nice to build a circuit that converts a single-ended battery to plus minus V. And <clears throat> there's, there's various ways of doing this, but one of the easiest, and one that was used in a couple of these papers, is to power an op amp, let's say that this is a 9 volt battery here. We're going to power the op amp between 9 and ground and 0. We're going to take the output back to the input for a unity gain and then we're going to hook the negative input to a voltage divider that's set to about VCC over 2. And we're going to put a capacitor here to suppress noise that might be coming through this voltage divider. <clears throat> and what we have then, I'm drawing this with connected wires because I don't want to imply that any of these wires are system ground. This is going to become system ground. This is now plus 4.5, and this is minus 4.5. So you directly ground the output of the op amp. Clearly, you don't want to draw so much current that it burns up the op amp. But uh, for any reasonable commodity op amp, this might be a 20 milliamp power supply. To be safe, you should probably also put a capacitor here to filter the output a little bit. So you encapsulate this. You make sure that none of the wires here are referenced to the output here because this is now going to be your system ground. This is as if, so everything inside here is like the world's weirdest battery with two outputs. There's just three leads coming out of here, plus 0.5, minus 0.5 in ground, and of course a switch. Is it possible to change those numbers if you like positive 6 and negative 3? Sure. As long as they add the manageable? Yeah, just change the, change the ratio of those, yeah. So if this is if this is 200k, then that'll be plus six and minus three. That's just a little aside that came up when I was reading this stuff today, but it's a nice trick. It works rather well, and quite often, if you have an, an extra op amp laying around, half of a 358 op amp. You can make yourself a split power supply and save yourself some uh, trouble in terms of DC to DC converters and all that kind of thing. Is that a question? No, it was just a head scratch. Okay. Any questions on that?
I think last time we started talking about filters, and I can't quite remember how far we got on that, but I think we started talking about what constitutes a good filter. I think that's where we were. Is that right? Does that sound, sound reasonable? <clears throat> what constitutes a good filter? Well, it depends. It depends on what we want to do with the filter. If our desire is to discriminate two sine waves, F1 versus F2, then we would like a filter that passes everything up to F1 and does not pass F2, or vice versa. So for discrimination, we want a sharp cutoff. Another possibility is that we want to, that we have a range of frequencies, 0 to F1, which is data, and then some F2 to F3, which is noise. And we'd like to denoise the signal while, while distorting it as little as possible. So in this case, if we have F and amplitude, we might want to have a filter that looks like this, 0 to F1, and then another filter from F2 to F3. And, well, actually we don't need that. As long as F2 is greater than F3, or F2, F2 greater than F1. But what we really care about is that all of these amplitudes here are the same. That the amplitude of the filter does not go like this in the passband, but is rather flat. That shows that we're not going to distort any of the data relative to any of the other of the data. <clears throat> Another possibility by what, by what we mean by a good filter is that we have a pulse that comes through the filter and what we want to have come out of the filter looks like a pulse but without the noise. We don't want something that looks like that to come out of the filter. So, we would like to have a very good filter. We'd like to have good pulse response, minimum distortion pulse response. We'd like to have good cutoff rate. And we'd like to have a flat response. You can't have it all without infinite computation. <clears throat> or in the case of analog circuitry without infinite circuit complexity. Now, you can get pretty good, and so we're going to talk about various approaches to, to, to this, but I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on one uh, geometry called a VCVS filter. There are, there are several others that you could use. Well, let's start with the basic passive RC filter. If we plot log of V out over V in versus log F, Bode plot, we get uh, the usual shape function with a breakpoint here, a 3 dB point, 6 dB point of 1 over tau radians per second. We could make this a sharper filter. We could make this a sharper cutoff filter by putting two sections in a row. The output of this then is affected exactly the same way as the input. 
as long as R2 is much greater than R1. And so we would expect that the, that the slope out here, instead of being minus 1, should be minus 2. So it's a sharper cutoff filter. But unfortunately, it's also more rounded. And if we add a third section, we get more rounding, going to a steeper slope, minus 3. And if we add another section, it's at a steeper slope to minus 4. They would all have the same pattern, right? So like R1 times C1 should equal R2 times C2. Yeah, yes. So the question is then, is there some way that we can get the effect of multiple RC circuits without this droop in here. Because what we'd really like is a filter that comes out nice and flat, drops off fast, and oh, by the way, produces a pulse that doesn't, that, that, that looks good. Now, let me go into that a little bit more. If you put a fast rise time pulse into an RC filter, you all know what you get out. Right? You get out something that looks like that. It's distorted. It has, it has a, 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 <clears throat> a finite rise time. If, and what you'd really like to get out is something that looks like this. You, want, you can't get out a perfect pulse because after all you do have to filter out some of the frequencies. Right? You're filtering out some of the frequencies, you're filtering out some of the Fourier components, it can't be an infinitely fast rise. What you would not like to see is a waveform that comes up like this, overshoots, rings, drops, and rings. So you don't want to go to something that is unstable and you don't want to go to something that is excessively distorted. So there is some optimum shape that is the best you can do for a given bandwidth. It turns out RC filters are always the worst in every regard. The reason you use them at all is they're really easy. You need a, you need a one pole, you need a, a fast, RC filter, high pass or low pass, two components, no power supplies, good to go. <clears throat> but you can always do better in terms of flatness of response, cutoff rate, and, and pulse shape. So the scheme I'm going to show you is a so-called VCVS filter. which is a combination of two RC filters and gain. C2, R, K minus 1 times R. And this is a nice filter for a, a couple of reasons. One is by choosing K, I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it again a couple of times. By choosing K, we can go from a filter, we can go from a filter that looks like RC to one that looks like it has a little peak to one that has a gigantic peak. In other words, we can tune the droop. As we tune the droop, we will also tune the pulse response. 
So by changing K, we can set the quality of the filter. Yes? So by changing K, we can go from a first order to a second order filter? Can do what? Can you go from a first order to a second order filter? You can go from a, it is a second order filter, but you can go from a perfect second order RC filter to something that looks like, in fact, an LC filter that looks like an oscillator that has that has an infinitely high peak. <clears throat> yes. By setting K here, yeah. you're going from an RC to a Bessel to a Butterworth to a Chebyshev filter. So, you so you get to choose the, the the classic name of the filter by setting K here. I'll go through that in more detail in a few minutes. And furthermore, if we switch this R and C whoop, like that, we've made a bandpass filter. If we switch both R's and C's, we've made a high-pass filter. Very handy. What if you put something like a Zener uh, with a very high K? So you have a peak, but the peak gets cut off, so then it would be a very sharp one? You can do various things, like you mean I clamp the output here. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, <clears throat> and that helps with with the one time you'd want to do that is, what we'll see is that if k goes to infinity here, or if k go, I'm sorry, if k goes to three, the height of this peak goes to infinity, and so for zero input you have a finite output. It's called an oscillator, and the oscillator will be unstable. In fact. And there, you'd probably want to have a zener or something to control the gain. But in a filter mode, you're never going to let k go to 3. So k is going to be on the order of 0, less than or equal to k, less strictly less than 3. And I'll, I'll prove that to you. One. Sorry. So, and if you want to make a higher order filter, if you want, say, a four pole filter, you can concatenate two of these, one after the other, use the output of one as the input of another, and make a sharper cutoff filter. What you find whenever you do that is, the sharper the cutoff, the better everything has to be matched. All the resistors and all the capacitors have to be exactly the same. The reason is, think of it this way, if you want very sharp cutoff, then you have to discriminate two frequencies extremely tightly. And the only way to do that is to be able to compute very accurately the frequency of the circuit, which means you need accurate components. All right, so let's analyze this monster. So first of all, V out, that's easy. I'm going to do this in, in vector notation. So this is a phaser. You all, you know, okay with phasers? They have they have phase and magnitude. So V out is going to be equal to V plus certainly. This is V plus times one plus. K minus 1 R over R. 
And if we simplify this, we find out that that's equal to V plus times K. And in this case, since this is purely resistive, uh, there is no phase shift between the input and the output, so I didn't really need to go phase or node here. Let's look at node A. We're going to call this VA right here. And we have, and we, we, we can use Kirchhoff's current law because we know then that the, the current out of this node the current out of this node, net current out must be zero. So we have V in, V A, V plus, V out. So we have that V A minus V in over R1 plus V A minus V plus over R2 plus V A minus V out over 1 over J omega C1 has got to equal 0. And if we look at node B here, VB, it must also be true then. So we have VA, VB, which is also V plus. We have capacitor to ground. So it must be true then for this node that the current out here plus the current out here equals zero. So V B, which is V plus, minus V A over R2 plus V plus over 1 over J omega C2 equals 0. It's both. It is both. Yes. So now we just solve this mess. So we can rearrange, we can rearrange this to be V plus minus V A over R2 plus J omega J omega C2 R2 over R2 V plus equals zero. <coughs> That's just to start identifying time constant, C2R2. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then we can substitute in, for V plus, we can substitute V out from here to get that VA is equal to V out over K times 1 plus J omega R2 C2.
Yeah. Now we can plug that into two and we get this horrible mess. Zero equals V out over K times one plus J omega C two R two minus V in over R one plus V out over K times one plus J omega C two R two minus V out over one plus J omega C one plus V out over K times one plus J omega C two minus V out over K over R2. And this is where you start wishing you had some machine algebra. But you can simplify this down quite a lot. Let me get all the vectors in here as appropriate. Because remember, these are not magnitudes yet. So we can simplify this. You can all do the arithmetic, so I'm not going to bother to do that. But what it comes out down to is that V out is equal to K V in over one minus omega squared. Oh yes. This became impossible to simplify without letting R1 equal R2 and C1 equal C2. When I did that, now we only have one time constant, tau. Plus J omega tau 3 minus K. And you could prove that to yourself. It's, it's not a huge amount of work, but I don't want to do it. So the observation earlier that if k equals 3, the system blows up at some frequency comes out right here. If three, if k is equal to three, this term disappears entirely. And when omega is equal to one over tau, when omega is equal to one over tau, this term goes to zero. Uh oh, zero denominator. That means for any finite input, the output is infinite. And of course, what we really care for the, about for the Bode plot is the magnitude of V out over V in, which is equal to K times 1 minus omega squared tau squared, because this is the real part and that's the imaginary part, right? Omega squared tau squared squared plus omega squared tau squared 3 minus k squared squared all to the one half. <clears throat> so what's, if k is equal to 1, If k is equal to 1, we get a perfect square here in the, in the denominator. And 
v and the magnitude of the Bode plot ends up being k equals 1, the magnitude of the body of the Bode plot equals 1 over 1 plus omega squared tau squared, which is exactly the same as the product of the response of two RC circuits. And you can do the numerical work, <clears throat> but what I like to do, I used to do in a lab, is to have people build this circuit, but use a trim pot here. And as you turn the trim pot, you can watch this, you can watch the pulse response change or the frequency response change as you wish, and you tune it the way you like it. There is there are some names that are associated with optimum filters. Some names that are associated with optimum filters. There's Butterworth. Which you can show is as flat as any analog filter can be. In the sense that all of the derivatives of that function are zero at v omega equals zero. You get a Butterworth on this circuit if k equals 1.58. There is another name, Bessel. As far as I know, Butterworth was the name of the engineer who invented this technique, whereas Bessel is, was a mathematician who invented a function that happened to be used to design a filter. A Bessel filter has the best pulse respond, response, and you get that with a K of 1.27. Ah, oh, they're not the same. Bummer. If you want maximum cutoff rate, if you want best cutoff, then what you have, your frequency response has a little bump and then it drops more rapidly than the Butterworth. This is sometimes referred to as a Chebyshev. C-H-E-B-Y-S-H. There's at least three ways of, of spelling Chebyshev in English. So I pick one. And the, uh, the K for this is between 1.8 and 2.1 or so. As you to go to higher and higher gain, this peak will get higher and the cutoff will get steeper. But the pulse shape suffers because the higher the gain, the more overshoot you'll get on the pulse. So I'm going to put these in our map and the MATLAB filter will have exactly the same frequency and pulse response as the analog filter does within the limits of the approximation of the of the of the arithmetic and so there is no particular advantage to doing an analog versus digital except that always without fail you must have a low pass filter on the input of your circuit before you go to the A to D converter. And it may be that a Butterworth is a good filter because it gives you good bandwidth and then cuts off rapidly to get rid of noise. So a second order filter will, will give you a better, a better performance than an RC filter, which is what you were using last time. So the only filter you absolutely have to do analog is a low-pass, a band-limiting filter for anti-aliasing. 
it may be that for noise reasons you may be able to get a little bit better performance with a filter analog, uh, analog filter and in terms of computation <clears throat> it takes a fair amount of numerical computation to build a filter that behaves as well as an analog filter does an analog filter is continuous time true continuous time uh, doesn't suffer from numerical noise suffers from voltage noise it's a different it's a different noise model I typically use both I would do simple filters low pass filter maybe a high pass filter to avoid saturation of a front end where you have a large offset you have to use a high pass filter analog high pass filter I do a high pass and low pass in analog and then any ad advanced filtering I would do in digital so if I needed a least mean squares filter that was adaptive I would not build that and program it any sort of adaptive filter or finite impulse response filter I'd, I'd program So we have a little bit of flexibility now in terms of, in terms of what we talk about because, um, because Lab 4, you have to, you're pretty much going to do on your own. Uh, what do you want to hear about next? Shall I, do some, shall I talk about some of the EMG paper, ECG papers? Uh, do uh, you want to read them up and ask questions? That's a better way to do it. Then I can get you to present it. All right. I'm going to do that. Thanks. Uh, well,